So much of what we do is based in fear. We're afraid. We're afraid to make connections sometimes. We are afraid of losing our identity. We're afraid of not having enough to eat. Even in America, we can drill down and live lives of scarcity. When clearly, that is not the problem. That kind of irrational fear, especially when we don't examine it, really drives a lot of our behavior. You're listening to Find the Good News, Episode 96, The PhD in the Glitch, a vegan series conversation featuring Hirsch Wilson, author of Firefighter Zen, a field guide to thriving in tough times, published by New World Library. Find the Good News is produced by Parker Brand Creative Services, a branding agency that thinks sideways, pushes forward, and gets your brand up. See what else we do at parkerbrandup.com. So often, the guests I've spoken with on Find the Good News have been relevant to what was going on in my life or in the world at the time. This hasn't been intentional or by design necessarily. I talk to the guests in turn, accepting whatever good people come into my life through the good news signal. It's a fascinating thing, really, to speak deeply with a guest and adopt or understand their worldview for the duration of these talks. I take the things we discuss seriously, and I'm always looking for something applicable and relevant that I can put to work in my very ordinary life. When I visited with Hirsch Wilson, author of the new book, Firefighter Zen, A Field Guide to Thriving in Tough Times, I had no idea that only a week after our conversation, I would be asked to put everything in our talk and his book to the test. You see, Hirsch's book is all about finding meaning, resilience, hope, and your personal mettle during the difficult days that are sure to come, moments when everything you've trusted in crumbles before your eyes. Hirsch, who has been a firefighter since 1986, calls these moments of discord and disruption the glitch. On August 27th, only nine days after our conversation, Hurricane Laura barreled through southwest Louisiana, and I, along with all the citizens of our region, got to experience the glitch firsthand. Everything that I had read in Hirsch's book and had taken away from our conversation immediately came into play. One day you're planning your next podcast episode, tightening the screws on your existing comforts, thinking about how to navigate existing glitches caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the approaching civil boiling point made worse by divisive, power-mad politicians in an election year, and the next you're quickly making evacuation preparations, shoring up resources, leaving stability behind, eventually returning to a powerless region with no potable water, filled with shattered businesses, crippled infrastructures, desperate citizens, and obliterated homes. This was the glitch, and I, along with many others, was in it. I thought of my conversation with Hearst often over the past weeks of stabilization and recovery. Hearst Wilson has found a way to navigate the glitch with practical wisdom and grace. In this conversation and in his book, Hearst does not skirt around difficult subjects and chooses instead to deal with life as it really is. He takes all the unsavory parts life brings as a whole. Feeling its sometimes coarse, bumpy skin, then in the midst of it all, he offers perspective to help us do more than just survive. He shows us how to thrive. I didn't know just how grateful I would be to have read Hirsch's book in advance of the storm. Having the opportunity to visit with him ahead of this natural disaster ended up being a real gift. It was a blessing in the glitch, and I hope that our visit and his book will be the same for you. Now... It's time to look at things just as they are, without the preconceived notions of this and that. Then tune your attention to this good news beacon, and press play on a little good news. Wake up this morning, dreaming up the story I can hear. The way it's going, cause you're laughing in your sleep. On the path to your deliverance, and a holy Old news, bad news, fake news. Sometimes you want to shut those signals down and seek a better source. With my Find the Good News Beacon series, I tune into good people doing good works wherever I can find them. I scan across the full spectrum of life, seeking out human beings that have turned their dials towards helping others, aligning their time, resources, and talents with goodness, justice, mercy, and love. In each episode, I sync up with the hearts and minds of my extraordinary guests, 
We have dynamic conversations that invigorate the mind long after our transmission has ended. I discover the critical life experiences that shape them, the perspectives that drive them, and the fundamental beliefs that have anchored them to a path of goodness. There's a lot of background noise in the world. My name is Oren Parker, and I'm cutting through the static to find the good. Hopefully by the time we're done... Um, we'll both feel like we have a new friend. That's what I always Absolutely great. hope Wonderful. to accomplish. So look, if you could, just for a quick minute, so my listeners know who I'm talking to, if you could tell us who you are and why you're talking to me today. Sure. So my name is Hirsch Wilson. I'm a writer and a firefighter in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I've been a volunteer firefighter for 33 years. Um, and uh, started in 1986 with my wife, and uh, I'm a, the assistant chief of the Hondo Volunteer Fire Department in Santa Fe County. So the book that you're, that's out today is Firefighter Zen. And so when, when I was asked to read this book, that was right up my alley. I was very, very curious what it was going to be about. And in fact, this morning, my wife was asking me, who, who are you talking to today? And I was telling her all about the book, you know, I'm not a firefighter, but I have a great respect for firefighters Mm -hmm. and your book shines a light on a dimension that I guess I, I've often sort of sat aside and maybe contemplated internally, but never really talked to about openly with anybody. And if you don't mind, I'd like to actually maybe start some of our conversation off by sharing a story. Sure. So just last week. Uh, I was coming home as I told you, we were moved, we're moving our studio into the home. So I've been kind of back and forth between my studio, making these sort of short runs, grabbing equipment, right. coming home, setting it up. And one evening I was coming back, it was, you know, right at dusk. I turned the corner and I see a red, uh, SUV flipped over on its top. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, nice. now, now the wheels yeah. were still spinning. There were no emergency vehicles out yet. So, I mean, it must have just happened. And right. so this is the weirdest thing. And my wife has always said this when there's some kind of thing like that, whether it's uh, emergency uh, of any kind, someone gets hurt. This sh- weird clarity sort of comes over me. And even though I'm not in the emergency field of any kind, I've always got this almost not sedation, but like one pointedness to where I feel like everything calms down. Everything slows down, even though it's an an excited time and all the stuff's going on. It's like the world quietens down and my brain gets clear. And so I pulled over my vehicle and as I walking over to this vehicle to see if this person's okay. I mean, because it was a bad, really bad wreck. I see these other people kind of doing the same thing. An older gentleman got to the vehicle ahead of me and I realized like I didn't need to go do anything because he was already arriving and he was acting as a comforter. I mean, he was talking to the man who was crushed in the vehicle, trying to get him to communicate. And I could see really clearly like this guy knew what he needed to do. He knew he couldn't do anything but communicate with the guy, make sure he was awake, let him know that there were kelp was yep. on the way. And so I asked him, is there anything I need from you? And he said, do you have any towels? As soon as I, I said, I'll go get some, here comes a nurse from an urgent care. Yeah. And yeah. as I'm look, so I decided, I, you know, the right thing for me to do is kind of get out of the way at that point. Yep. Cause there were two yep. people who knew what they were doing already there. I couldn't add to, right. 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 So as I stepped back and went back to my vehicle and kind of watched all the different players in this drama that was taking place, you know, I was watching people's faces and I'm going, some people had their hands over their mouths aghast, you know, and some people, you could tell by their body language, which ones had this natural uh, ability to sort of run to the aid of the, of the, of another, whether that comes from training or it's, or whether it's natural, you could see that. So anyway, very quickly, uh, the first people to first person to arrive was a police officer. He, you know, is blocking traffic, but then the fire department arrives. 
Right. And I stayed and watched the whole thing because it's just was, it was fascinating to me. And I guess to take it to like a Buddhist perspective, even I was watching them work and how quickly they worked and how each part, they acted like one organism. <coughs> Everybody was doing something different. One person bracing the vehicle. The person came out with the jaws of life. They were helping, you know, stabilize the guy. And it's, it was like one body with all these arms. Yep. And I did get this sort of beautiful Buddhist image of like Avalokiteshvara, like with all these eyes on the hands. And each hand was a different aspect of that compassion. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. So anyway, it was kind of cool to be reading your book. I say all that to mean this, that I was reading your book at that time. <laughs> and so I guess it gave me a second set, a second sight to, in, yeah. to almost appreciate what you, what you do more. Yeah. And so anyway, yeah. I know it's a long, a long, uh, in, uh, a long recollection there, but I just wanted to share that with you because your book had a, played a big part, I think, in the way I perceived what was happening in mm -hmm. that moment. Great. Yeah. I think that's a, uh a very common scene for us and a, a couple of things it's it is uh, when we arrive on scene i think one of the addictions of it is extremely focusing right everything that you've been worried about in the last hour goes away and you are absolutely focused on so saving someone um, and with with the fire department and it's, and it's a sense of community of camaraderie of intense focus and knowing that that you're living a very high purpose which is to um, take care of another human being. Yeah. I, I, I was fascinated with the, your book right from the beginning. You know, I love the stories in there because they're one, they're so uh, easy to put yourself into, mm -hmm. you know, I love the story about how y'all made the decision to become volunteer firefighters, but then the very stark r reality of it hits you right as you're about right. to have dinner. <laughs> you know, It's like, yeah. wait, we're yeah. going to have to do this any time of night. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that was that, interesting. That story, yeah, it really sticks with me. I mean, it was just, it was like the cold water being dumped on you. It's like, oh my God, this is real. Yeah. And uh, yeah. There are so many things that I thought, and I, I got in the, out of the book, and I wish I could get my, my youngest, well, my oldest son to read it, because I, you said mm -hmm. that at one point in the book that this is a good good book for anyone, really, that's mm -hmm. maybe just to, to look at life in general. And I... I, I felt that way as I was reading it, you know, I thought, man, this would have been a good book to get as a young man, yep. you know, especially if you're a young man that maybe isn't getting really good mentorship anywhere. This would, this is filled with that type of stuff, or even for somebody my age, I mean, I'm 46, but I mean, still, you know, highly applicable, but especially, and I, I think about this often, there's so many things in that book that I was like, gosh, it's funny what you don't share with people that you think about, but you my father passed away mm. uh, five years ago. And mm. so I've often daily had this background math, math in my mind because he would have been, he was 67. Right. Mm. Yep. And so every year that has passed by since then, I've had this line where I went, well, my dad lived to be 67. My grandfather was maybe set. One of my grandfathers was 70. My, my other grandfather was 56. So I had those dates in my mind and I, there mm -hmm. aren't that many men in my family. I'm one of the last ones in that bloodline. So you have to use them as sort of this marker of, well, I mean, there's not a trend of living very long. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I have those benchmarks and I was like, you know, there's times when I'm laying in bed with my son and I go, my youngest son mm -hmm. and I, and he's sleeping and I go, okay, if I live to be as old as my dad, then yeah. I have yeah. roughly a 21 years left. How old will he yeah. be? What, yeah. how, what's the value of this time? That's two decades plus, And that's not that long. So there's these weird little things going on and you talk about that in the book, right? I mean, in a yeah. different way, but. Yeah. I, I think uh, one of the things I, that I wanted to really be clear about, is how firefighters kind of see the universe, right? Yeah. How and not not like the Einstein and uh, and uh, you know the the astrophysics part, but just how what are the rules in the universe we live in? And I think one of the most important rules, and and uh, Buddha said it's it is our the our biggest illusion is that we have time, and and it's we don't. Uh, we do this exercise in the book where 
we kind of help you determine how much time you have left. And it, it turns out to be, for a lot of people, 30, 40, 20 years, which, as you know, as you get older, is like a, is a heartbeat. It's mm. not very long. Yeah. And, and so the question becomes, um, that's, that's just kind of an absolute. It's immutable. So what are you going to do with the time you have left? Yeah. What are you going to do? Why are you here? Right? Why are you here? And that um, is the big question. Yeah, I think that is the big question. That's that's the original question, right? I mean, mm. that one question leads people through all kinds of the different paths in their life. I mean, different discoveries. For me, I, I, the truth of the matter is, and it's why I love talking to people like you, that was my question that really changed my life when it made a big shift was just that. I mean, and it can be depressing. Like, I've had conversations with folks where they say, I can't sit around and think about why I'm here because it creates an existential crisis for them. Yep. You yep. know, and I, and yep. I kind of posit that that very existential <clears throat> crisis is sort of what cracks open the door sometimes, you know? Yep. Yep. I think, um, right. You come to this point and I talk about it in the book, um, uh, because the other part of the firefight universe is not only do we have a limited amount of time, but there's this thing called a glitch. And yeah. the glitch, the glitch is that any one of us could die tomorrow, yeah. could die this afternoon, right? Yeah. There is no guarantee. So you put those two things together, then it becomes imperative to ask that question. What am I going to do today? What is my day about? What is my life about? Now, I, I absolutely understand that people come to this point where it's like, it's like, what's the point, right? If life is short and there's a glitch, what is the point of living? And I, th I think you get to this point, and, and either you can become a nihilist and just say life has no meaning, it's pointless, right, uh, and go down that road to depression, or, uh, like, um, or, or you say to yourself, I have to create purpose for myself, mm -hmm. right? I have to have meaning. Um, and whether you think that, that this is a spiritual quest or whether you think um, that, it, that that's it purpose and meaning is something we have to develop for ourselves – it's that it's at that point in our lives that we have to make that decision. And to me, to me, kind of going, I mean, it's, 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 it's brutal, but uh, going down the road of nihilism and depression is kind of lazy thinking to me, mm. right? Because uh, uh, I think the answer is so evident. The reason we're here is to help people, is to help decrease suffering in the world. And there's so much suffering in the world. Uh, and, and especially now during this pandemic, I mean, the amount of pain in, just in this country is, is unbelievable. Um, I get emails every day uh, from friends and Facebook posts about, hey, if, you're, if anybody's having trouble out there, if you need food, if you need someone to take care of your kids, call me because I want to help. And it, it's kind of a marker of how difficult times are right now. And our job, our job as human beings is to help each other, is to, is to be there for each other, to help help decrease pain. That's why we're here. And as a firefighter, um, you learn very quickly that everybody has a story. Everybody has got something going on, right? Uh, and, uh, and I think firefighter, it transforms you. It's transformative as a firefighter uh, when you see that because, I mean, we go to calls, you know, and it, it can, you know, like 90% of the calls we go, go on are not major things. They're minor things. Uh, but firefighters have this habit of sticking around, helping out, uh, calling people later, checking in, shoveling driveways, all these kinds of things, uh, because we want to help. We want to be there for people. And I think that's the, the important re realization that you get as a firefighter. God, there's so much to unpack right there. I, I love everything that you just said, and I agree with that. I mean, so often, you know, there's, there are ideas that are worth challenging, but to me, that is – also, what we are here for is to sense that oneness. I mean, to be in the position that you're in and for people who work in any kind of service to humanity, you do get to sense that, that oneness with other beings. I mean, you get to yeah. see, like you just said, everybody has a story. Every, you know, it makes me think of, um, I remember watching the movie Seven Years in Tibet and to, to some people, this may seem silly, but I remember thinking, what a powerful thing. It was when I was really young. You know, I was kind of first being exposed to Buddhism through media. And mm -hmm. so I was watching when he was building the, the movie theater, Brad Pitt's character uh, in Tibet. 
and they, they, they were like, no, no, we can't dig here. There's worms, there's worms. And they were like, these worms, these are our, these are our mothers, you know, these are our sisters, these are our brothers. That is a perspective that to some may seem silly, but I find that if you can have compassion for the worm, how much more compassion can you have for your fellow human being, you know, and, and seeing other people as stories, you know, as yep. textured yep. and detailed, not just these, you know, gray, plastic, nameless, faceless others that need resources that are taking from your resources. I think right now, for sure, there is a a sentiment of uh, survival in a lot of people's minds that if I don't get mm -hmm. my resources, someone else is going to get my get them. And I need to shore up, you know, what's good for me and mine and you take care of yours. There's like a dividing right. wall. Yes. But, but if we feed each other and help each other. Yeah, we begin to sense that we are one. I mean, that creates more love, right? I mean, more yeah. compassion for each other. That's the only thing that's going to save us. I, I don't think shoring right. up individual resources is going to save us. No, I agree. I think if, if you look at all the great religious traditions, they all come from a core uh, sentiment of, of taking care of others, of serving others, of alleviating pain. Um, and... Uh, whether you know it's Christian, it's Jewish, it's Muslim or Buddhist, that, that all come, they all have that same message. One of my uh, uh, favorite poets said that religions are, are different poems about the same experience, mm. right? And and I, I think what happens is, the, I think our, our what the, you were just talking about, so much of what we do is based in fear, right? We're afraid. Um, we're afraid to make connections sometimes. We are afraid of losing our identity. We're afraid of not having enough to eat, right? I mean, even in America, we can drill down and, and, and live lives of scarcity when clearly uh, that is not the problem, right? So, so that kind of irrational fear, uh, especially when we don't examine it, yeah. really drives a lot of our behavior. And you see it now. You see it now. For sure. I, I want to back up a minute, too, because uh, – that was you brought it up and I was so glad and you brought it up real early in this conversation. So I didn't even have to get to it is the <laughs> is the glitch. And I want to show you something, because when I read that in your book, uh, it made me think of this immediately. So for years, I, I went through a divorce over 17 years ago and the first job I got after that divorce, I wrote these words down and I taped them to my computer it says change yeah. is the law. Exactly right. So this has been with me for all those years, this little piece of paper. And I I remember when I was reading your book and you started talking about the glitch, I was like, oh, yeah, that's this. Change is the law. This is the factor that I cause that causes more suffering in my life when I resist it, when I fight against it, when I when I am always saying, oh, I, this is fixed. This can't change. Not true. And you get in there. The glitch will come in and upend every bit of that in a moment. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and so it's almost like a uh, sometimes I think it's the temple to the glitch. You know, <laughs> my life is, oh, yeah. it's a, you know, it's like it's it's work with because, you know, as I was reading that, I thought, yeah, the glitch is a good thing, too. I mean, you could have a great life and you can think, oh, I'm doing everything correct. And then the glitch mm -hmm. comes along and upends that. You could also, in the opposite end of things, have a, a lot of troubles, but there's still opportunity for the glitch to come along and bring a blessing in the midst of yep. that chaos. Yeah. You know? Yep. I think of, go back to March 11th this year, right? We all had calendars. Yeah. <laughs> we all had plans, right? Right. And, and March 11th happens, and, and we go into this lockdown, and calendars are useless. We throw our calendars away. Right. And, and that was kind of the global experience of what individuals face all the time. Right. There's a glitch. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Winston Churchill said um, planning is in indispensable, but plans are useless. Mm, right? Yeah. Um, because uh, the life life interrupts plans. Yeah. Um, and I think on the on the we think of ourselves as firefighters is like we're the we have a Ph.D. in the glitch. Because wow. we see that we see that happening every day. Someone's life plan is interrupted, um, and and we it just becomes how we see the universe, how we see 
uh, like working out that um, it's a day to day thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I often I sit in the morning hours. You know, my my meditative practice is to walk in the mornings, um, and and then come and I, I sit down in my kitchen, and I just kind of realize that in my kitchen I can I can look out through a window and see the red uh, gate to our garden, right? And I just kind of appreciate the, that it's it's a warm a warm uh, Tuesday morning, yeah. And really, because that's all I, all we really have is right now, yeah. right? All yeah. we have is right now. You, yeah, you shared a story in the book that I thought was really interesting. It's a perspective I've heard from um, several friends of mine who were in the military as well, who had went off to fight in wars overseas or conflicts and then come back and try to reintegrate into the world. And you, you talked about that feeling you get after, you, you know, you, you have a job during the day. A lot of volunteer firefighters do have a job during the day, and you could get called out at any time to go yeah. deal with something that to most people would just be a horror. Right. And then the next day have to go back to a day job. And you talked about that, how you have had often had that sense where you look around and go, you want to almost like scream at people and go, wake up, wake up. What are you doing? Yeah. You know, they're, you, Absolutely. You, you know, what do we care about these little trivial things for? We're missing the real um, blessings in life. Yep. Yep. And I've heard that as well from, especially one good friend years ago, he came back, he was working at a department store and I hadn't seen him in years. And he said, it's hard doing this job, you know, dealing with inventory and, and all the stuff. He said, after everything I've seen overseas yep. and the, the real picture of what the world looks like outside of America, uh, he said, I feel like I'm living in some kind of delusion. You know, this yep, is all absolutely. like, I'm, this is almost like a fake to some degree. Absolutely. absolutely. I remember um, that's the genesis of that story was we had been, uh, we'd been to a, a cardiac arrest of a 64 year old woman. Uh, and she, when, you know, when she, when she collapsed, she hit her head on the counter. She, so her head was bleeding and we worked that code, uh, for 45 minutes, uh, almost an hour. And then we called it because, you know, we weren't, we were not able to, to save her. And I went from there, then I had to go to the grocery store. So I'm standing in line at the grocery store and people are complaining about it's a long line. Why aren't the cashiers faster? And you go, you want to go, you're out of your minds. Yeah. Right, you're standing. You're alive in a grocery store buying food that's just abundant sitting here. here. Yeah, S- sitting there, and and I just came from, you know, from this death where and the husband was grieving and and in shock, and you guys are worrying about about being five minutes late. Now you don't say that, right? Because you just don't. But that's kind of what you're thinking. Yeah, I've heard people say, I, I, I mean, I look. I can't even say the words to tell you how I get this. Mm. This is this is my worldview. I mean, what you're talking about, and it sounds negative to so many people. And I go, no, I just don't want to pretend like this stuff isn't going on. I don't want to pretend like this guy in front of me in the grocery store line, as you mentioned, could have just lost his father like I did five years yep. ago. I don't want to, yep. you know that these people aren't going through their own personal sufferings. And when I do see those things as negative as they may seem, that's the fissure right there that I can connect with them and go, Oh, you're human. You suffer too. Yep. And now I can love you. Right. I don't see you as the enemy other anymore. That dissolves completely, even in the grocery store line, even in traffic. Yep. Exactly. Right. And I, and I think once you've had, once you have this perspective, um, and especially, I think about it now because it's so divided and it's just it's just so uncomfortable. But once you have that perspective, you understand that the greatest gift we have is to be kind. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and to go out every day uh, with and, and, and especially now because everybody's wearing masks, right? Um, and you can't see faces, right? Uh, and it's just a strange world. But I think the impetus to be kind to hold doors open for people to let people cut in front of you in traffic, right? Yeah. To find those moments to be kind are really important. Not only, not only because it spreads kindness in the world and not only because it makes you feel better. Um, but it just, it just helps everybody calm down. It helps everybody see that they're connected. 
And I think right now that's what we need more than anything. I agree so much with that. I mean, that to me would change everything if we could see our connectedness. You know, like I have a next door neighbor uh, that we have completely different political views. But, you know, a couple several months ago, I got stuck in my front yard and I mean, I have a four wheel drive pickup truck and I couldn't get out of this hole that I had got in. It was just too deep. And I was I was determined to get it out. And he saw me. That he saw. I mean, he's like, oh, he right. can't get out. He he drives over, hooked up with a tow strap and pulled me out. And it was very kind. And he left. And I was like, you know, it's funny because we have such different views about things. But he still extended his kindness to me. Yep. Yep. You yep. know, and that's all it takes is just a continuing effort. to. He, I mean, he could have sat in his porch and watched that and went. Well, that sucks, man. Yeah. Hope he can hope he gets out and then went back right. in the house. You know, he right. didn't have exactly to come right. help me in the rain, you know, exactly but right. yeah. but he did. And so that's the little things like that that makes a huge difference. Yeah. I'll I'll I i want to share a story with you, but just to just tell you how much I appreciate what firefighters do. Um and it's really personal, but so bear with me. Uh several years ago. I go on a personal retreat. Let me back up. I go on a personal retreat to a particular place where I, I had a real life changing, changing experience over two decades ago. So I go every year, twice a year to visit a grave of a, a dear friend. And so a few years back, it was that weekend that I go and I was at that at the end of my retreat, so to speak. And I was driving home. It's about almost three hours from where I live. And I was driving home. I was about an hour back into the drive home. It, the sun had set and I get a phone call from my wife and she said, Oren, uh, my, my daughter was supposed to be at work, my mm-hmm. oldest child. And she said, Oren, um, she's not at work. Her car's here and the bathroom door is locked oh, and God. she's not answering when I, yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, immediately I just, the worst goes to your mind. And so I told, so I, my emergency, whatever my brain does, the drugs, I always tell like a pharmacy, it like injected whatever it does. And I started giving these instructions. I was like, do this. Let me talk to the boys. I had them go to a different room. And then I talked to my wife. I was like, put me on video so I can see. She kicks the door in my daughter is on the floor and she's breathing, but she had attempted suicide. She had taken a bunch of, she, she survived herself. I will say, but, but my wife to this day, when she talks about that story, she always talks about the fire department. And we just talked about this a couple of weeks ago when the the week ago, when I saw that accident, she said, when I called nine one one, the fire department were the first people to show up and they did, you know, you think fire, you think we fight fires and, and generally yes. But she said they arrived and were like angels. Mm. I mean, before the ambulance, before the, before the sheriff's department, they were like angels in our home. And I was, you know, you got to, I was helpless on the road. I mean, I'm two hours away. There's nothing I can do. I couldn't drive faster. I couldn't, Ever, it was nothing. I felt completely at the mercy of. I mean, I'm this is going to sound probably crazy to some people, but I felt at the mercy of the universe and every yep. power or force in the universe. I was like, I am at your mercy right now. I'm completely helpless. Yep. And the fire department literally arrived and saved my daughter's life, like like divine beings. I mean, that's yep. the only way I can say it. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I, I, we owe, um, I mean, just gratitude and, and grace, whatever we can offer back, you know, even if it's just words of affirmation mm-hmm. that, yeah. that, that was a blessing to us, like a truly, true blessing. Yeah. 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 I, I think when you go through something like that, it really changes who you are fundamentally. Um, and, you know, I'm so sorry. I'm so glad she's okay. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the important part. So but I, I can't believe, I can't imagine uh, going through that as a dad. I have two daughters. I just yeah. can't imagine going through that as a dad. Yeah. yeah, it's terrifying. I mean, but at the same time, I guess, you know, 
that was the way I kind of, I guess that's almost like why it felt a little sedative the other day watching our local fire department work in that accident. I was like, wow, this is, I know some of it's training. I mean, I know training plays a big part in most things, but at the same time, there's something special about that unity that I see. I mean, we saw it here. My wife saw it here and recounted it to me. And then I've seen it time and time again. So your book to me, I guess, embodies that in a different way. I'd never really quite uh, put my finger on before, Mm -hmm. you know, and the lessons are, are universal in a large degree. You know, people can, uh, Anyone can read this and learn something. I think it also, to me, the other thing I, I noticed in your book was, uh, in a strange way, it was almost like resilience building. It was mm-hmm. like there may be people who are sort of insulated against the suffering of the world, right? I mean, I know mm-hmm. people that are insulated to a large degree sure. from suffering. And so you read a book like yours, I think you you have those personal stories in there where people go, oh, I guess I hadn't really considered these things i don't think Mm -hmm. about these things Mm -hmm. yeah i I think uh, i think the experience you had is emblematic of uh, what firefighters go through um where where you go on a couple of bad calls and and you kind of realize that the universe is quite different than you might imagine it to be uh we talk i talk about in the book how Lori and i my wife before we were firefighters you know we kind of had an insular view of the world that things are fine plans worked out um, you know, the, the world was at best neutral. And then when you become a firefighter, you go, holy cow. Uh, again, back to the idea that everybody has gone through stuff right now. And our society teaches us to suck it up, not talk about it. Right. Um, which ends in a lot of trauma. Yeah. But, um, but, it, but if you know, our, our, our kind of belief is that, um, if we're honest, uh, and understand each other, uh, we can see that life is life as Buddha said, life is difficult. Life is difficult. Yeah. Um, and, and once we realize that and kind of drop the charade, then we have a shot at, at really finding joy, which really comes in helping, helping others. Yeah. Excellent. What do you think? I mean, for people that are considering my, my wife saying the same thing, she goes, I'm looking for my next good read. What do you, what do you hope people get out of this work that you've done with this book? I think, um, a couple of things. Uh, first, I want people to kind of stop and kind of take an inventory of what life is really about. Right? We are so busy, uh, even in this lockdown time. Um, we're we're busy. We're worried. Uh, we're worried about the future. We're we have guilt about the past, um, and we don't take the time to reflect and say, "What is life all about?" Right? Uh, and second is is really ask deeply ask the question, um, what what is my purpose here? Mm. Why why am I here? Right? What what meaning do I have? And and that answer has to be, I mean it doesn't have to be this me on a soapbox, but it is using my talents, right, my my natural talents uh, to help people and to, and to make the world a better place. Even if it's my community and my family. But that's why we're here. That's why we're here. And we can get um, seduced by life is about uh, material goods that that life is about uh, promotions and money and all that kind of stuff but that does not lead to what you know purpose and joy and and so whether you know i you have to work to make a living to support your family right and so we have a couple of choices either we find work that is that it serves our purpose and supports our family or we, we, you know, we do the work we need to do and find a different way uh, to, to be of service to others. But if you don't have that last piece of, of using your talents to serve others, um, you, end up, you end up at the end of your life going, what did I do? What yeah. was my life about? And you don't want to be there. I definitely can say that that's definitely what I got out of that book. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. that's accurate. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's something I would highly recommend folks read. I mean, and I think anyone should read it, but I, I don't know why as I was reading it, it reminded me a little bit of a book, not, not even, I mean, that they were written in the same style or anything, but years ago I read a book about that a man had wrote letters to his son and the book is called Letters to My Son. And I re- mm-hmm. I read it when I was a young man. And I remember liking that. I thought, man, this is like having a, a father figure in a book. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't know why, as I was reading your book, I got that same feeling like this is, mm-hmm. I don't know. I felt like a type of, almost like a type of mentorship or fatherly voice, which mm-hmm. I mean, you're a father. That makes sense right. if you're writing <laughs> an authentic <laughs> right. voice. Right, right, right. But yeah, right. I definitely picked that up. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was like, right. this feels like a, uh, a wise friend, like an, an, a friend that could be like a father. I don't know, a mentor type of friend writing yeah. this book. And so it's, I think anyone reading it, I hope they pick up on that as well, because it's definitely comfortable to read. Uh, yeah. And the things were sticky. And I love your language. Again, like the glitch, that's 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 my new word for changes the law. <laughs> like, oh, right. I'm going to be paying attention and, and looking for the glitch in day-to-day life. Right. I, I love that. Right. I mean, it was so yeah. sticky to yeah. the way you captured yeah. that. Uh, thanks. Hello, Good News listeners and friends. It's time for the Fishing for Goodies segment of Find the Good News, where I take a back seat and let the questions from the Good News Fishbowl take over the interviewer role. If you're a longtime listener, then you know that normally there was an ad right here for the Brimstone Museum and Henning Cultural Center in Sulphur, Louisiana, my hometown, and the place where I produce Find the Good News. Thanks to the devastation caused by Hurricane Laura, instead of an ad, I'm making an appeal. Hurricane Laura, the strongest hurricane to hit Louisiana in over 150 years, made landfall on the crossover hours between Wednesday, August 26th, and Thursday, August 27th. This monster storm made a straight path from my hometown, Sulphur, and her sister city, Lake Charles, Louisiana. I evacuated that Wednesday evening ahead of the storm and returned the Friday after, and one of the most heartbreaking things I saw was the devastation of our historic treasure, the Brimstone Museum. Trying to describe the scale of the damage to southwest Louisiana escapes words. Every resource imaginable was brought to its knees. Utilities, water, gas, food, shelter, and medical. Life instantly returned to a cycle of shoring up supplies to survive the coming heat, humidity, stabilization, and recovery. While national news media has moved on, the multi-layered human suffering remains, especially for our poorer communities made even more vulnerable in the aftermath of this savage storm. The road to recovery will be long, and many of the decisions and actions of our national, regional, and local politicians could be put under well-deserved scrutiny at this time. But what can't be criticized is the goodwill, mercy, compassion, tenderness, and drive to help that we've seen from local and regional volunteers. Each day they bring hot food, water, cleaning supplies, tarps, gasoline, and set up every single day in parking lots serving from sunrise to dusk. One particular organization, Care Help of Sulphur, mobilized immediately. Volunteers selflessly putting their own needs aside to care for the citizens of Sulphur with all of their varied needs. I put a link to the website of Care Help of Sulphur on my website, as well as some reflections and links, photos, and video about what we are facing right here in Sulphur, Louisiana, the home of Find the Good News. You can find that at findthegood.news slash donate. That's findthegood.news slash donate. The link is also in this episode's show notes. In fact, This episode was produced on power provided by the loving gifts and efforts of this podcast guests and listeners. Any help offered to Care Help of Sulphur or find the good news in the aftermath of Hurricane Laura is deeply appreciated. Brimstone Museum will be saved and hold this spot once again, someday. Care Help will continue to serve the people of this city. Good people will always rise up to do good works when there is a need. Now... Let's take that dive in the fishbowl. Well. So look, we have a part of the show uh, that shifts gears and it's um, at the end. It's called Fishing for Goodies. And I basically have this fishbowl here that's full <laughs> of questions. And yeah. so what I do is I draw three questions cool. out of the fishbowl and then we will see... Uh, We'll see what the universe has in store for you. So I give up at this point. So let's see what we got today. All right. Well, here's a good one. How does love factor into what you're doing with your life? That's a great question. What a great question. Uh, And I think about in in, uh, a couple ways. So um, a number of times 
after really horrific calls in the middle of the night, right? Um, I come home and I used to come home um, and I would sneak into my kid's bedroom and I would sit on the floor and I would just listen to them breathe while they slept. Right. Yeah. And, and um, you're so grateful that your, your family's alive and well, right? Yeah. Nothing, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And there's that, that deep, 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 sense of love right there. Right. Um, I think the other part of it is it's very frustrating to me right now is, um, that we're so divisive as a society right now. Um, and, and, and we're so at ends and, and it, it stops us from almost from being able to love each other, right. Yeah. From being able to have human connection, right. Um, from uh, and I think the in our fire department, our fire department is we have got, I think the only communist, anarchist, socialist <laughs> firefighter I've ever met, right? To uh, to kind of Democrats, middle of the road, all the way to kind of uh, you know, don't tread on me, gun toting, militant Christian conservatives. But we come together as a fire department to serve a higher cause, yeah. right? Yeah. And that and there's a love underneath that. And so we on the fire department we talk about the brother and sisterhood, right? We are brothers and sisters no matter what our political beliefs are, no matter what religions we are, and coming together to do the most important work on the planet, which is helping other people. So that's, that's beautiful. That's, my take. that's beautiful. I mean, that's something special. I mean, look, I'm not going to I'm not going to try to hide this. I mean, that's actually the space I want to live in. I mean, I, yes. I've tried I'm, – I'm a, I'm a religious and spiritual mutt. You know? I mean I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, if you paint every color on a palette, I don't live in the places where the stripes are. I'm where the colors are all bled together around the edges because – That's great. That's a great – that's lovely. Well, I can't find that one strip of color that I belong in. I've tried too. It's not, not for yeah. lack of trying, but every time I get into an organization of any kind – I find walls and boundaries. And what you just described in the fire department, no doubt, is uh, uh, something beyond that, a bigger tent that's more all-inclusive. And that's what I've, I've really been looking for. And I think, I think ultimately, I just it's humanity. I mean, the yeah. tent's that big. It's humanity. Yeah. It's cr- other creatures. It's, yeah, it's so big. And it's just I, – I, I guess I'm just going to – I'm trying to be content that – there is no um, actual organized home for me, and yeah. uh, that's just the way it's going to be. And live more yeah. comfortably in that space. I've always felt like there was something wrong, you know. Like, am I unable to be a part of something? What is this? But what I've realized is it's not that. I actually love being a part of things. I just don't like seeing other people left out in the cold. Yeah. I'd rather go sit out in the cold <laughs> with yeah. those people, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a beautiful thing, man. I mean, to have that and see that, that's high dimension stuff in with in your perspective of the fire department. Dude, does everybody take that perspective for the most part in within the um fire department? I think so. I mean, I think um I, I think you, you learn to be more tolerant right away. Mm, yeah. Because you're you're involved with all kinds of people, right? Um I think we're highly respectful of everybody's um, faith and and their belief system, um, and and we just focus on our work. We focus on taking care of each other and focus on our work. Yeah, beautiful. That's a wonderful question and uh, yeah, wonderful answer. All right, so this is question number two. It's a little different. <laughs> what is one of the most useful things that you own? <laughs> for, for me it'd probably be a journal a journal yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah because i'm a writer by heart so I'm, I'm always writing yeah and i'm always uh i need something to write on and, and capture ideas every day so so when did you start writing i mean at what point in your life were you like man i like to write or was it just like did it begin with just capturing thoughts and ideas or was there like a always there it was always there. I mean, I started writing, and, and, and I loved writing in high school. And, yeah, and, and my papers would be too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I get that, man. I'm I'm a uh, I write creatively, and then also I I write reflections, you know, and yeah. I have to watch it because I I dive off the prophetic end of the cliff half the time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. you can start with a small reflection, and then all of a sudden it's like it just keeps uh, folding out and then folding out, and I'm like, okay, I got to pull this in because nobody's going <laughs> to read this. It just turned right. into <laughs> exactly yeah. a manifesto yeah. or something. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I've written many manifestos. Absolutely, never showed them to anybody. <laughs> oh yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Once I started writing, I used to write in a journal a lot more than I do now. I write in it. I have a journal now that I write in once a year. But uh, once I started writing, writing on my iPad and carrying it around with me, I was like, man, I'm. I I think I might have opened a can of worms because nobody reads it. I just it's just for my own. Honestly, yeah. though, writing yeah. is good, right? Just for your own yeah. mental uh, health. Absolutely. I mean, to work out absolutely, ideas yeah. and stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Get a journal, guys. An yeah. Indispensable tool. <laughs> All right. So here's the third question from the fish bowl. What are some of your personal rules that you refuse to break? Um, I think not to go to bed angry. Ah, nice. Yeah, that's a that's an important rule for me. Um, um, I'm, I'm always thinking safety first, and driving my kids crazy. <laughs> um, I think I'm working on I'm working on being more honest. Yeah, but it's a work in progress. Now, what do I'd you say. mean by that? What what's something like? Can you give me an example of what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um, I've always been kind of an amiable person and not wanting to hurt people's feelings. Gotcha. Right. And I think, especially at my age, I think it's, it's time to be more of a truth teller yeah. and more. And by truth, I mean, here's my truth. Here's sure. what I understand. And, and to be more upfront and honest about that. So those, that's a work in progress because that's difficult for me, but that's kind of what I'm working on. That's interesting. I can relate to that. I, I can. I uh, I tend to try. Uh, probably uh, is where my wordiness comes from. Mm-hmm. Is I I, I want to make sure that I'm being clear and that I'm presenting a communication to somebody in a way that is not going to sting. I want to make sure that mm-hmm. they know I'm not. I'm just telling them the truth. I'm not trying to hurt them. Mm-hmm. And because it always sometimes the truth does hurt. Mm-hmm. And I, I have, I do sometimes tend to uh, over embellish it and uh, to try and make it more palatable. And I mm-hmm. am learning the same lesson. I'll probably be learning it as long as I live to, yep. to just let it be yeah. just what it is and not worry so much. Yeah. 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 I don't know where that comes from for me, but I definitely get it. Yeah. So the last question that I typically ask folks, and I don't have one sitting on my desk today or I'd show it to you, but we send every guest a coffee mug. And oh, cool. uh, on the front side has got Find the Good News, which, you know, that's the name of the yeah, podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. But on the back is uh, a question I think you'll appreciate. And it says, did anything good happen today? And the origin of that question, question yeah. comes from basically trying to change the way we were interacting as a family. We used to say, how was your day after a busy day? And, you know, we tended to gravitate towards, you know, oh, this guy was a jerk today or, oh, this customer said this ridiculous thing or I got stuck in the traffic. You know, it was always like a we, we've highlighted those things instead of the graces and the blessings. Yeah, so, yeah, that's great. By just shifting that one word, we all focused a little harder on that. I'm going to totally steal that. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, hey, it's yours, man. Please do. <laughs> so I'm going to ask it of you. Did anything good happen today? Absolutely. Um, and, and and I think there's two things. You can make good stuff happen. Yeah. Right? And then you and then as important, you can see the good stuff that's happening and not ignore it. Yeah. So um, you know, my, the, it's it's early here. So the 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 again, the best thing that happened to me so far today was um, you know, I said goodbye to my wife because she had to go to work. Um, my daughter's up and walking around and I went on a walk with uh, um, our dog around our little one mile loop and just focus on what a dog sees and what a dog understands and, and perceives the world. And it's wonderful. And it just makes me feel good every morning. That's wonderful. Yeah. You like, are you a morning guy? You like the morning? I, I'm one of those guys who's like a middle of the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I'm really good from, I'm good from 10 to two. Yeah. 10 to two. Right. 
I do love the peace of the morning, though, oh, as far as yeah. uh, I, that's my time. I mean, I love sunsets and I like the night, but there's something special about sunrise to me and yeah, watching the yeah. world wake up, you know? It's, yeah. Yeah. It's a little muggy and wet here down on the coast of Louisiana. Yeah. So everything glistens, you know, this time of yeah. year, especially. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's nice if you can stand yeah. the, the humidity. <laughs> yeah. My friend, uh, who's a retired firefighter has said, uh, the best thing he's learned is not to watch the news right yeah, now. Right. Just listen to music or. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I- do you, and you know social media. Do you use social media quite a bit? Oh, I mean, yeah, I have to. Yeah, yeah, me too. And you know, I've had to retool that. And I mean, even the show came from the idea that that was going to be a, a big part of a big change I wanted to make. You know, I, I we try to treat it like a signal now. And I think yeah. about that often. What am I putting out there, and what am I taking in? I mean, yeah, and just tuning yeah. those dials to where I'm not constantly consuming these negative side swipes, you know, that'll just take you out of the present a hundred percent. There's already enough in just a life to deal with. We don't need all the extra. Right. You know? right, exactly. right. 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 Yeah. Well, this is great. Oh, you know what else could happen today? Your book came out. Yes. Woo. Yeah. I forgot all about that. And that's yeah. a big deal. Very exciting. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so let's so let's let's end it up end on that. So the book is uh, available everywhere today, or is it digital it as well? Should be av- it should be available everywhere. It's available digitally uh, at Amazon.com. Okay, but um, you know the uh, the pandemic has kind of messed up bookstores for right. now. But it should be available from uh, your local bookstore. Excellent, excellent. I um I I usually put a link to the show to bookshop.org so if folks want to order. Perfect. Yeah, cuz yeah. I think some of that money goes back to the local bookstores. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. 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 So we'll we put a link there. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I, do you like to for your folks that read your books and to connect with you on social media to go to your website? Yeah, absolutely. And stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Just go to my website or my email is hirschwilson. Uh, at mac.com. Excellent. Guys, yeah. check the book out, especially, and I know this is just my own perspective, but if you have young, uh, younger children, maybe that are in high school or even going off to college, the Firefighter Zen, a field guide to thriving in tough times, give them some perspective that's positive. You know, this is really something they can use. Uh, and hey, get it for yourself too, uh, no matter where you're at in life, on your lifeline. I'm more thankful every moment that I found. Thanks for listening to my Beacon Series conversation with Hirsch Wilson. If you'd like to experience Hirsch's book, Firefighter Zen, make sure to visit the links in the show notes. If you found something of use in this conversation, consider visiting findthegood.news slash donate, where you can help this mission and organizations working to help the victims of Hurricane Laura. I thank you for pressing play and for syncing up with this good news beacon.